Good morning. My name is Nina. Today's reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. Please follow along in your own Bibles or simply listen as the scriptures are read. Again, that's Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting with verse 12. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singer of the doxology. Parents and guardians of children in nursery, preschool, and third through fifth grade, you are invited to escort your kids to the back of the room to join Kids Common upstairs. As you are able, we invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God has brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Good morning again. My name is Matt. Welcome to Haverhill Commons Church, where we confiscate your phones and um, make you thoroughly disoriented and anxious. You're welcome. Um, if you drop your phone in the bin during the settle-in time, perhaps you're feeling a little unsettled at this point. You're not so sure about this. It feels kind of weird, kind of bad, uh, kind of distressed to not have your phone with you. Um, we're only a minute or so in. Right? And I mean, all the little things like, what if we're missing something? What if something's happening out there and we need to know about it? What if somebody needs to reach us? What if Matt says something really memorable and profound and you just want to run it, write it, write it down in a note? Right? Or what if all I say is super boring and you just have to sit there and just take it for the next 30 minutes? Our phones are right there, right? They're just in this bin, like sitting up here. 30 minutes isn't really that long. And we could grab them anytime we wanted to. And in fact, if you need to grab your phone for whatever reason, like, don't be scared. Like, come grab it um, from right up here, uh, right in front of everybody. <laughs> um, but I wonder, what might happen if we're willing to let them sit there unattended for the next 30 minutes or so? What might we learn about ourselves and our relationship with technology? So thus unencumbered, I invite you all to join me in a moment of silence and reflection as we pause to bring ourselves before the Lord. Dear Jesus, we come to you this morning um, longing to release our grip on the things that we cling to so that we might cling more to you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So I almost am never without my phone during the waking hours of the day. Last summer, we went to visit family in Missouri, and my pops picked us up from the St. Louis airport. Uh, we were settling in for this two-hour drive to get to the middle of Missouri, where our families all live. We stopped at a McDonald's along the way to rendezvous with my mom, because my mom and dad were going to go to their home in central Missouri, and then we were going to continue on my family to Megan's house uh, at a different part of central Missouri. And before pulling away and driving away, pops asked me to hand him my phone. So my family's on those family plans, right? Uh, our contract was up. As part of the renewal process, we were all entitled to get phone upgrades, yay. So to save me the trouble of going through all the upgrade process myself, my dad offered to take my phone, to trade it in, and to give me a new phone and bring it back to me in a couple of days. 
a couple of days? I was not mentally or emotionally prepared to make that kind of a choice in a McDonald's parking lot in the middle of Missouri. So I use my phone for so many things. Like, I use my phone for so many things. It's how I read books. It's how I listen to podcasts. It's how I read the news. It's how I check the weather. It's how I watch shows. It's how I pay for stuff. It's my navigation device. It's how I take photos. It's how I shoot videos. It's my alarm clock. It's my sound machine. It's how I count my steps. It measures my heart rate. It's got all my apps and games and my music. It's got all my email on there. It's got all access to documents. It's how I order food. It's how I stay connected to my family and to my friends and to the whole world. My phone has everything on it. You, you might know the classic U2 song, uh, With or Without You. <laughs> I can't live with or without. So alarmed that I was applying the lyrics to a love song to my relationship with my phone. As an act of defiance, I handed my phone to my pops, ready to prove to the world that I, Matt Webble, did not need my phone. And pops drove away. And I got behind the wheel of my brother's minivan, only to immediately realize that I had no idea where I was going. <laughs> Megs, can you pretty please get out your phone and give me directions so that I know where I'm going? Apparently I, Matt Webble, do need my phone. What is your relationship with your phone? Is it a source of connection? Is it a source of stimulation? A way to avoid awkward conversations in the elevator? A way to look busy even when you're not? A way to relax? If you're like anything what I described a second ago, you feel an ever-present temptation to spend every moment of your life, phone in hand, scrolling social media, text messages, news feeds. And on one hand, being plugged in and connected is incredible. I mean, last year we actually got our kids um, little watches um, for them to wear. Uh, they can only do a few things. <laughs> one of the things they can do is call us. Um, one of the things they can do is tell us where our kids are so that if we need to track them down, we can find them. It also has some kind of pet game where you try to keep a virtual animal alive, but whatever. Um, those watches give us peace of mind, right, when our kids are on the ski slopes at Bradford or when they're bicycling around the neighborhood. Pretty great things about tech. But there's also a downside to keeping our phones constantly strapped to our bodies. I thought this cartoon, if you can see it, had a pretty good take on playing phone tag. Right? Phone tag. It's kind of funny. It's kind of sad. Our phones are changing the way that we interact with each other. Shirley Turkle, author of Alone Together, wrote this in the New York Times. Studies of conversation, both in laboratory and in neutral settings, show that when two people are talking, the mere presence of a phone on the table between them or in the periphery of their vision changes both what they talk about and the degree of connection that they feel. In other words, it's hard to be in two places at the same time. It's hard to be present to what's in front of us, to a child, to a friend, to a teacher, to a job, to a sunset, to our own souls and spirits and embodied realities, and then also be connected to the entire world at the same time. And there's pressure to have our lives completely connected and oriented to what's happening out there. Even our sense of what makes something real is now connected to whether or not we can capture and share the filtered photos, right? If I order a really cool birthday cake for my kids and I don't post it on Instagram, did it ever really happen? Our phones have become essential. For anyone who has any sort of public life, musicians, authors, bloggers, marketers, salespeople, it's almost impossible to detach from the connections that we have through our phones. For anyone who feels responsible for others, teachers, doctors, pastors, parents, it's hard to unplug because what if somebody needs us and needs to get a hold of us? And it's also frustrating because somebody always needs us, right? And our phones can interrupt us at any time of the day or night. You probably don't need me to tell you that our dependence on technology has a dark side. I mean, whole books have been written on how tech is impacting our minds and bodies and leading us to exhaustion and overstimulation and discontent. Dr. Larry Rosen, a psychologist and computer educator, he's the author of a book, Eye Disorder, has even demonstrated that certain technologies seem to be related to personality disorders like narcissism and obsessive and compulsive disorder and panic and anxiety disorders and depression and mania and ADHD. But like it or not, we're riding this wave of a tech revolution. Tech's here, and it's not going to go away. So what are we supposed to do about it? As Christians, we turn to Scripture to help us navigate our lives. And over the past few weeks, we've been exploring God's invitation for people to observe a regular rhythm of rest. 
So far, we've looked at Sabbath as an invitation to cease, just to stop and do something totally different than you normally do. Week one, we looked at Sabbath as an invitation to feel the feelings that we often suppress and subdue. Week two, last week, we looked at a Sabbath as an invitation to trust, to trust, to relinquish control, and to trust the Lord. Today, the invitation is simply this, to unplug, to unplug. Now, you're not going to find a verse in the Bible about unplugging from tech. The Bible is an ancient text written a few thousand years ago and has nothing, nada, no verses about smartphones or Instagram or virtual reality. Come on, Bible writers. You are letting me down, right? But then again, the Bible has a lot to say about being human, about being in community, about being in relationship with God. It has a lot to say about our hearts and our allegiances and the objects of our worship. It has a lot to say about the source of our lives, the health of our bodies, our minds and souls, and all of these principles have something to say about our dependence on technology. For example, the fourth commandment. The Bible actually gives us a full articulation of the Ten Commandments in two separate places. One of those places is Deuteronomy 5, which is the passage that Nina just so wonderfully read for us. And the other place is Exodus 20, two different places with the Ten Commandments fully listed. Like twins, these two lists have very much in common. And like twins, they have some subtle differences if you look at them both closely. The fourth commandment is almost the same in both lists. Observe the Sabbath by keeping it holy. You have six days to do ordinary work, but the seventh is a day of rest. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. In both lists, same, same, same. But then the lists get different. Exodus 20, 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea. But on the seventh day, the Lord rested. So in Exodus, the reason, the purpose, the meaning behind Sabbath is rooted in creation, rooted in the rhythm that God wove into the fabric of time. But here in Deuteronomy, Sabbath is not connected to creation. Here in Deuteronomy, instead, Sabbath is rooted in something else. It says this, Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord has commanded you to rest. That is why the Lord commanded you to rest, because remember, you used to be slaves. Sabbath, because you used to be slaves. And consider how that might have sounded to a former slave. Consider how slaves might have received an invitation to rest. How alien must that have been to them? Because slaves can't rest. They don't have holidays. Slaves don't have weekends. Slaves don't have paid family leave. Slaves don't have choices. Choices are made and dictated by taskmasters who do not treat slaves like people, but like machines. Slaves don't rest. Slaves work. That's what they do. They're tools used by an empire, squeezed every day of every year until their bones break and their spirits erode. But after the exodus, they are no longer slaves. They're given back their humanity. They are free. And a huge part of freedom is agency. It's the freedom to make choices. The fourth commandment challenged them to choose what they never could choose in Egypt, to set aside time, to stop, to cease, to rest, to worship. Remember, you were once slaves, but you are slaves no longer, so rest. So if Exodus roots Sabbath in creation, this is part of the rhythm that God has made. Deuteronomy roots Sabbath in liberation. Rest is something that freed people do. And both are really good reasons to rest. We looked at creation a few weeks ago. Today we're going to focus on Sabbath as a rejection of slavery and an act of defiance against the old taskmasters. And I do think choosing to rest is an act of defiance, a declaration of independence from the patterns that this world feeds us, an opportunity to live in the freedom that God has secured for us. But, but Webbs, we're not slaves anymore. We aren't slaves in Egypt but you don't have to feel the lash to be enslaved. Romans 6, don't you realize that you you become a slave to whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. 1 Corinthians 6, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. And we can become a slave to anything. We might not think of ourselves as slaves to technology or our phones as our taskmasters, but I think it's at least worth asking the question. Are we freely choosing our engagement, or have we become so dependent, even obedient, that our engagement isn't really a choice anymore? Can we stop whenever we want, or are we stuck in a pattern? 
that we're no longer in control of? Are we free or are we slaves? The Israelites knew they were slaves. It was obvious. Our taskmasters are less obvious. But if you do even a little digging, you'll be reminded that there are giant corporations behind almost all of our technological dependence. Digital products, smartphones, and apps are sold by companies, companies that want to make money, companies that make money by keeping us constantly engaged, by keeping us constantly clicking, constantly plugged in. This is a quote from Ed Sazinski in his book, Reconnect. Our devices and social media apps are designed to be invasive and habit-forming and compulsive. Many of the people who design digital technology and social media have publicly stated that their products are designed to be toxic and addicting and manipulative and deprive users of choice and free time through habit-forming feedback, feedback loops where reactions and notifications become rewards for us. Along those lines, I encourage you to watch The Social Dilemma, a pretty sobering Netflix documentary with this tagline, never before have a handful of tech designers had such control over the way billions of people think and act and live their lives. These taskmasters that are modern might not crack a physical whip, but they create a culture, a world, a psychological campaign, an algorithm of chains, every bit as intentional and every bit as effective as formal slavery. And it's all based on the science of how people work. These companies know that when we see someone has tagged us in a post, our brains release a little hit of dopamine, a little zing that feels pretty good. But after a few hundred zings, that hit isn't quite as satisfying, and our brains want us to find something bigger or more that will zing us even better. We need more and more and more to get the same feelings. And normal life starts to feel pretty dull in comparison to the rush of likes and comments. And when we use their products, these digital companies collect our identities. They have teams of engineers who take what they learn about us and leverage it into hundreds of more hits. It's no wonder that the average person checks their phone every 10 minutes. 60% of us sleep with our phones. 89% of us check our phones within the first 10 minutes of being awake. 75% of us use our phones on the toilet. When a notification comes in, 75% of us look at it within five minutes. And as Marcus told me this week, when we check our phones, it can take us 15 minutes to get back to full attention to what we were doing before we checked our phones. And what do these companies do with all of our clicks? They share our habits with other companies so that they can use our information to sell us products and services and apps that they know that we'll already want. And we will purchase and consume the things offered to us thinking that we're free to choose without ever realizing that someone has been pulling strings all along. There are giant forces at play here, I think. Forces like greed, forces like explo exploitation, forces that I think Peter talks about in Peter 2.19, they forces that promise us freedom, promise us freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. For you're a slave to whatever controls you. You're a slave to whatever controls you. Do our phones control us? Well, they sure have a lot of our attention. There's a line from the movie Lady Bird that draws a connection between attention and love. Indeed, the question is posed, attention and love, aren't they the same things? Have you ever given your attention to a screen, unable to shift your eyes away, unable to play a game with your kids when they want to, too distracted to enjoy, them, to enjoy a meal with family and friends, too divided to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit or anything else because you're locked in to hear, right? Attention and love, aren't they the same things? I think, yes, there is very much a spiritual dimension to this. Giant text screams for our attention. The last thing they want for you to do is put down your phone. The last thing they want for you to do is rest. They will take your life, and they can give you very little in return. I know I'm a slam in tech, and I know that there are great things about it. Meaningful changes happen across the world because we're more connected, more aware of human suffering, like what's happening in Gaza right now. Stories and images have always sparked justice movements in our world. Some of those who led the 2011 revolution in Egypt said it started on Facebook and was accelerated by social media. Take away phones and so many of the injustices in the world would remain in the dark. So tech isn't all bad. We're not going to become the anti-phone church. But I want us to be an honest church. Honest about ourselves, honest with ourselves about how things are influencing us. That doesn't mean we cut phones out of our lives entirely. It means reorienting our lives to put things in their rightful place, our eyes fixed not on our phones, but on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. 
We're allowed to interface with tech. We're allowed to do anything. But not everything is good for us. We must not be slaves, but rather live in the freedom that Jesus has won for us, life and life abundant, rest for our souls. And as we've said all series, God's invitation to rest is not a reward for work. It's not something that we earn. It's sheer grace. It's sheer gift. If we choose to rest from our work, we're choosing to embrace liberation from what enslaves us without guilt, without apology, simply because God told us that we could rest, simply because we're free. You know, Christians have always had to figure out how to be in the world without worshiping the world. Every good thing, phones, food, friends, family, will be a blessing to us if we receive it as grace. And every good thing, phones, friends, family, food, will enslave us if we worship it instead of God. Galatians 5, for freedom Christ has set us free, so stand firm therefore. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Don't submit to slavery. I would argue that it's hard to truly rest in the freedom we have in Christ with notifications buzzing every few minutes. It's easier to rest, I think, if we hand over our phones. As always, God is ahead of us, providing for us a spiritual practice that can deliver us from our enslavement. Sabbath rest, I think, can help us keep things in perspective. Handing over your phone earlier might not have felt super brave, but doing that regularly is a countercultural act of defiance. In some Jewish families, even today, it is customary to have a Sabbath box to hold items in it that are not needed on the Sabbath, things associated with work, things that symbolize work, things that distract, things that interfere with rest. It's just an idea, but what if we bravely put our phones away for at least some part of every day? What if we bravely put our phones away for some part of every day and for a longer period of time each week? A tangible expression of our willingness to unplug completely. With our phones away in a drawer, in a box, we're freeing ourselves from the hold that technology can have on us, freeing ourselves from the constant connectedness that keeps us from getting physical, emotional, and yes, even spiritual rest. And it might seem extreme or even silly to have actually a box and actually put things in it, can we just decide in our minds not to be distracted? Can we just decide not to be slaves? I mean, maybe. But as embodied creatures, we live in this physical world. And I think our surroundings matter. What we touch matters. We never fill our bellies with simply junk food all the time. But I fear we're far less discriminating about social media and our phones and the tech that we consume. As God's children, we are free. And I believe part of that freedom is the freedom to rest. Ruth Haley Barton, a spiritual director and author of great many books on practicing spiritual rhythms, <clears throat> has been practicing the rhythm of unplugging far longer than I have. And she says that she's noticed that when she really unplugs, when her phone is actually physically out of her reach, she experiences a different kind of freedom, a new layer of rest. Her walks are different. Lunch with a friend is different. An evening with her husband is different. Her nap on the couch is different. Her vacations are different when she unplugs. In my own experience, leaving my phone behind has also the amazing effect of seeming to give me more time. Normally, when I take a walk, I'm listening to a podcast. That's kind of just like what I do. And when I'm listening to a podcast, 30 minutes flies by. But if I leave my phone behind, 30 minutes feels like forever. I pay more attention to the sounds around me. My brain is more active, more creative. My reflections are deeper. It's interesting and humbling that when I set down my phone and its constant stimulation, I'm more aware of the beauty around me in the world, and in the people that I see, more fully present to all the things inside my own heart and mind. Again, tech is not the enemy. Don't hear me saying that. But, like anything, it may become a tool used by the enemy. I don't think we need to be afraid of tech or to set this bin on fire. Although I might set fire to every Chromebook in the school district. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, my goodness. But I do think we ought to be honest and wise and Christ-like when it comes to tech. It's good to be connected. It's not good to be constantly connected. It's good to be connected. It's not good to be constantly connected. It's good to be productive. It's not good to be enslaved. A Sabbath box is just one idea. There are others out there. Turn off your notifications. Set your phone to do not disturb. 
If you're interested in more ideas on how to untangle from tech, I really recommend Tiffany Schlein's work. It's a book called 24-6, The Power of Unplugging. She is a non-religious Jew with super helpful, super practical ideas on how to unplug, including how to help friends and family support us in our efforts to unplug. Parents, guardians, you're trying to figure out how to shepherd your kids through an overwhelming tech labyrinth. You're trying to parent your kids through the most complex mental health landscape that we've seen in recent memory. Trying to help your kids who'd rather text you than talk to you walk the way of Jesus. A helpful site that I've used a lot is called ScreenSanity.org. ScreenSanity.org. On the front page of ScreenSanity.org, they have a stat that you might find interesting. Guess what percentage of today's youth say they want to grow up to be influencers? What percentage of today's youth want to be influencers when they grow up? 86%. Hence, ScreenSanity.org, right? And Screen Sanity breaks uh, things down for you uh, into ages of preschool, elementary, middle school to help you as parents. They tackle everything from video games to screen time. Finally, last fall, uh, if you remember, a friend of the comments, Sarah Cohen Johnson, came and did a soul training class on all of the stuff that I'm talking about this morning, parenting in the digital age. And she gave us access to a lot of her resources that she uses, including a phone contract that you can use with your kids, as well as parenting guides, which are pretty helpful, to TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram and sexting and porn and cyberbullying. Hopefully you made a note of that on your phone. All right. I took your phones. Happy to share any or all of those resources with any or all of you. Uh, they're also on our website, uh, HaverhillCommonsChurch.org, under Family Discipleship, under Technology. Everything I just mentioned is listed under there as a resource for you. Whew. How you doing? It's been like 25 minutes since you surrendered your phones. How you guys doing? like instinctively reaching, you heard a buzz, you thought it might have been yours. Statistically speaking, 71% of us experience stress or anxiety without our phones for 30 minutes. So 71 of y'all are freaking out right now. (laughs) But even still, perhaps the distance has given you some clarity, some perspective, some conviction. Maybe it's given you a reminder of your true identity that you are free liberated by the resurrection of Jesus so that we can live our lives on God's terms and not on the world's. And don't fret too much. Chrissy's going to have this box in the back of the room. She's the keeper of the box. And you can rush as fast as you want to to grab your phones at the end of the service. But I do encourage you, even as we sing these next two songs, to reflect on what the Spirit is doing in your heart, to reflect on your relationship with technology. Are there any digital idols in your life? What are the things that get the majority of your attention? And what do those things give you in return for all the attention that you surrender? Are you able to unplug? And what does that look like for you daily? What does unplugging look like for you weekly? And most importantly, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to do that in order to be present to the Lord?